Hey, what's happening? Hello, everybody. Um, got my microphone all rigged up here. Let me know if this works or not, if it's working. Um, I'm probably not going to pay attention to comments too much. This is a live video, so if you're watching this replay, this is there's pro probably people commenting. So I'm going to try not to read those comments, but I'm going <laughs> to read from this book. i got to find where I left off. It's been so long. I, psh, I think I marked the page. We need to continue on with this book. I think I just started it. Let's see. A salamander can only be a salamander. Reach the end of his patience. Shaman. Oh, he was just meeting the shaman. He was just meeting the shaman. He was out. He was out meeting the shaman. All right. Uh, let's go. Alabar. Alabar meeting the shaman. Good to see you all. Let me know if the microphone's working. If it's coming in clear. Um, I'm gonna just keep reading. Thanks for joining me on YouTube. Here we go. Uh, hmm. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's just back up a little bit. The shaman sipped ritualistically. Alabar told his whole story when only the dregs were left of one one's tea and the other's tail, the shaman took several short pieces of string from his pocket and began to knot them together. Hmm. Hmm. Mumbling all the while. In my net, he mumbled, I bind the sobs of the dark ice crackling. In my net, I bind the axe's response to the pine cone. I bind the larva curved belly. I bind the hole in the sky where the comets escape. I bind the roots of the rainbow and the flights of the alder. He went on and on in that manner. My net binds the hornet's deaf grandmother until Alabar was ready to grab him and give him another shaking. Just as Alabar reached the end of his patience, the shaman unclasped his hands, revealing the piece of string, which in the knotting he had turned into a delicate violet, its petals the color of love bites on a collarbone. Alabar reached for the flower, but it burst into flame and was consumed in the shaman's fingers without burning them. It was Alabar's turn to mumble. In the future I shall be more careful about whose door I knock down, he said. Mopping up with his sleeve, this tea, the tea he had spilled in his astonishment. The shaman laughed. Ha! Don't pay attention to that old magic, he said. It used to be powerful, but now it's only the pastime of a few crazy old farts. Who remember how to talk with the weeds? <laughs> oh, let's go, let's go to here, hold on. Alabar sought to protest, but the shaman interrupted. Man is turning away from the plants and animals, he said. Slowly he is breaking his bond with them. Someday he will have a, to reestablish contact if the universe is to survive. For now, however, it is probably best that he sets on his own in his new direction. How so? A salamander can be only a salamander. An elk, an elk. A bush, a bush. True, a bush is complete in its bushiness. Yet its limits, while not nearly to serve as some foolish men would believe, are fairly obvious. The peasants of Alfric are bushes like salamanders. Uh, they were born one thing and will die one thing. But you, you have already been a warrior, a king, and a serf. And from the looks of it, you aren't enough yet. Thus, you have learned the secret of the new direction. That is, a man can be many things. Maybe anything. In the past, there was little separation between the lives of plants and animals and the lives of men. Nowadays, there are men who practice separation, not only from the creatures, but from other men. The Romans, with their Christianity, have promoted the idea of human individual. But you are neither Roman nor Christian, and you are no less smitten. So perhaps the spirit is in the air. The Romans encourage individualism, but they maintain rigid control. Sooner or later, men will come along with beliefs in the supremacy of the exceptional, extraordinary, isolated individual will cause them to de declare themselves exempt from the control. 
in their uniqueness, they will not hesitate to defy accepted standards. Oh, these men will give Rome a room that shall follow Rome a very large headache. You, Alabar, I suspect you are among the first of such men. No, 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 no. Do, do not object. I can tell that my words both delight and excite you. It was true, and in his delightment and excitement, Alabar had his tea grow cold, so the shaman warmed his cup. Here, you, an ordinary peasant, I would dazzle you with such other tricks or two. I'd berate you and comfort you, and send you back to Alafrek to face your death without alarm. Most of the peasants are content to die. For them, death means the sensation of toil. Cessation, cessation, like the ending of toil. The end of it. At last, they can drop their soiled and battered bodies and enter the dimension of pure spirit. <laughs> Plants and animals are even more comfortable with death. It is in the natural end. But man, by his nature, is an unnatural animal. If any creature stands a chance of defeating death, it is man. If you are an ordinary serf, you would send, I would send you back to Alfrek to assist your neighbors in the public purification they are undergoing at the end of the old year and the beginning of the new, to help them mock the things they love best in order that they might revere them the more. I'd send you back to the ware and the sacred mistletoe, the king of the bean, to be sacrificed to the gods, old goddess of architecture, or wait, agriculture. <laughs> Instead, I encourage you to ride the strange wind that is blowing through you, to ride it to wherever it will carry you. But which way shall I go? Alabar says. That is between you and the wind. You seem to be searching for a kind of immortality. With that, I cannot help you. In the realms that I inhabit, death is a companion. One does not quarrel with the friend. If you desire to meet masters with power over death, I suggest you travel to the distant east, as far as Hellas. Far, far beyond Hellas. To Egypt, then. In Alabar's mind, Egypt, with its confounding mirrors, was the end of the trolley line. As far as Egypt is, you must go there times th that, three times that far. Holy crap. Three times further than Egypt. Are you trying to trick me? I would fall over to the edge of the earth. Oh, thank you. Somebody supported me, I think. I feel like I've got either some support or something or like a new follower. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. I heard a sound. It was a nice, pleasant ring. <laughs> Does that mean turn the page? Remember when you used to hear that sound when you are a kid and you turn the page? All right, where was I? Uh, the shaman snorted with the laughter. <laughs> Alabar, the earth does not have an edge. It was Alabar's turn to laugh. Ha! <laughs> he thought it might be in the company of crazy old farts after all. What utter nonsense, he declared. You are a free and special man. Alabar, therefore I'm going to let you in on another little secret. Listen, listen, listen. I converse regularly with the birds and the fish. And the birds and the fish have assured me many times that there isn't any edge. We live on a ball. Alabar, we do. Keep this quiet. The world is round. Shh. Keep it quiet. So heady was the idea that Alabar felt faint. Oh, the world is round? He gulped his tea and gazed into the shaman's eyes. Eyes shiny as and black as the bean in the cake to ascertain that he was not being joshed. When he was convinced of the shaman's sincerity, he stood and gathered his hides about him. I suppose I should be off then. I suppose you should. I surmise that several feasts of feasts will be consumed ere I am returned. However, I should be pleased to build you a strong new door when next I pass this way. You plan to return then? If the world be round, I can scarcely help it, he chuckled. <laughs> Someday I should like to mingle with the clan again, even if I must disguise myself to do so. 
All right, it sounds like he's going to get out of there. He's going to escape all this. He's not going to, he's like, I am not the king of the bean. I will move on. The shaman shook his head. Mm. I have it on good authority that Lord Alfred's men are going to attack your old citadel as soon as the roads are dry in spring. They will kill all who resist and baptize the remainder long before your return. If you return, the independent city you once ruled will be out, will be but another Roman outpost on the frontiers of the Holy Empire. I don't know why I went in an accident like that. I don't. Alabar smacked his palm with his feet. Ugh. There, I must warn the clan. Ah, I'll organize a defense. Maybe we'll attack first by the golden whiskers of the morning star. We'll show the turnip eaters what battle is about. Uh, they'll need more than just one to save their asses. Er, I and my boys are thorough. Blah, 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 blah. Too late. Alabar, too late. As if to somehow illustrate his point, the shaman tore a badger mask from the wall and tossed it into the fire. The foe is not merely Lord Alfred, but the whole of the empire. It is too large, too entrenched, has too much momentum. The world is changing, Alabar. He, he gestured at the burning of the history. History begot room. The history someday will bury it. In the meantime, you've other fish to fry. You, have you forgotten? Are you to be an individual, a trespasser in territory? None else has had the wit or nerve to explore? Or just another troublesome mosquito to be swatted by the authorities? You're no longer king or warrior, remember? But something new. It will do you, your clansmen, no good for you to be slain alongside them. But who can guess what benefits may result from a new life, holy lead? <laughs> you are correct, said Alabar, he sighed. The clan is lusty women and his noble hounds lies behind me. It is forward I must go. After embracing the old man, he marched out into the snow. He aimed his boots at the east and forced his heels to follow his toes. Quickly the little hut of the shaman was out of view. Out of sight, too, was the village and the manor. So long, manor. A brilliant English accent. Oh, sorry, I stopped to read comments. I didn't mean to. Fast forward this part. Ten seconds. Forward, forward. All right, here we go. Uh, it sounds good. Okay, good. Out of sight, too, was the village of the manor. Frawl must be suspect that I'm taking Swiss, Swiss, swift, swift. The word swift isn't very swift, right? Swift. All right, here we go. Frawl must suspect that I am taking swift advantage of my bean ship, straddling another's thighs at this late hour, he thought. He sensed that he was causing her some pain, and that, in turn, hurt him. He would miss Frol and the babies, perhaps more in intensely than he missed Wren and Meek, which there was a strange wind blowing through him. Was there not? Was it not blowing him away? The sky was a velvety black paw pressing on the white landscape with a feline delicacy. Stars flying like sparks from its fur. The fry, the cry of an owl broadening, brooding. Oh my gosh, I can't read right now. Hold on. The cry of an owl broadening over its ruby appetites. Cut through the frigid air like a vibrating pin. Then all was silent except for the soft crunch like ants chewing wax, of his boots upon the snow. His steps quickened. They took up a gay rhythm. He was very nearly dancing across the frozen fields. The world is round, he sang, in tune with his footfalls. Existence can be rearranged. A man can be many things. I am special and free. And the world is round, round, round. <laughs> a few weeks later, a few weeks later, but they just fast forward. A few weeks later, Alabar was awakened by a hot sun in his face and a hot stench in his nostrils. He sat up in his grass and rubbed his eyes. 
He sat up in the grass and rubbed his eyes. Don't ask where the rest of the dream went, Alabar. All dreams continue in the beyond. The warm sunlight gave him a lazy, comfortable lie around all morning and stretch your armpit feeling. But inside his nose, the cilia were waving. The turbinites were knocking. The schizophrasmatical recesses was on the red alert by wooden, wooden honey pots. That's the scent. Wooden honey pots. That's what he smells. Nearby, a flock was grazing, and Alabar guessed the aroma must be its fault. But fire on wool and a pox on mutton if sheep were so rude to the proboscis. Perhaps in warm climates, sheep take on the odor of their cousins, thought Alabar. For sure, it was the essence of goat that permeated his nasal passages, and rudding goat at that. With a flock so close, there must be a sheep herd in the vicinity. Maybe I can talk to him, talk him out of a few crumbs of breakfast ere I get me to a prettier smelling place. Alabar went to rise, but something snagged his cloak and pulled him back down. Again he tried to stand. Again he was yanking to the sword. He reached behind him to f- free himself from the branch of rind that held him, but he touched nothing. Suiting forward a few feet on his rump, he made another attempt at rising, and another, and another, each with the same result. Angry and a little frightened, he drew his knife and, still sitting, whirled around. There was no one behind him. With all of the elastic in his leg muscles, he snapped himself upwards. Thud! Down he went like a sack of meteorites addressed special delivery to gravity. This time he just sat there, fingering his blade, giving every sheep on the hillside a good look at his expression of frustration, bewilderment, and humiliation. Nearly a quarter of an hour passed before he slowly, centimeter by centimeter, sinew by sinew, he commenced cautiously to draw himself upright, and he made it. He was standing, he stretched, expelled a sigh of relief, and fluttered the lashes of an ewe twenty yards away, and strode off, only in misstride to fall flat on his new growth of beard. What the hell? His beard grew big. An outburst of the wild, magnificent laughter rounded over the hillside and echoed from the crags in the distance. Wild laughter, because its notes were outside the range of the normal human voice, and so uninhibited as to make the shaman crackle seem fetid. Magnificent laughter, because it seemed huge in scope and rare in distribution. Laughter that was simultaneously strange and familiar in that instilled in Alabar the fear of the unknown and the joy of self-recognition. It was laughter that might have been squeezed from the tubes of his own darkest heart, then amplified fifty fifty times through the bellows of a loon's ass. The laughter evidently affected the sheep, for all at once they began to beat and kick the oldest rams in the flock, cavorting as if they were lambs. A breeze suddenly raked the landscape, drawing from the grasses a dark murmuring, settling the thistle brushes to chattering like chin teeth. Bees abandoned the gorse to fly in crazy circles a few feet above the ground, while the bird song in the previously had gladdened the hillside lowered appreciably, appreciably, appreciatively, appreciably in volume. Its caprice trills and whistles replaced by a constant melodic line, almost reverent in tone. The unease that Alabar experienced was piercing as a thorn, yet there was a pleasant tightening in his groan. His groan. I lost my space. After growing, it threw me off. Yet there was a pleasant tightening in his groan, and his limbs felt ticklish and kinetic. Inspired beyond his control to join the flock in its awkward, awkward dance, the way he found himself moving, moving horizontally through the grass made him wonder if he had not been seized by the serpent power, if there were not an edge after all, and if he were not dangerously close to it. Hey, a voice called out, why doth thy crawl about on thy belly? Art thou a man or worm? Compelled by the voice, which was, which was both dreadful and jolly, threatened and seductive, Alibar forgot his recent failures and scrambled to his feet. "'Where are you?' he asked in the shaky falsetto. "'Why are you laughing?' Oh, wait, that's his voice. "'Why are you laughing?' "'I am everywhere,' the voice boimed. "'And why shouldn't a god laugh at the punny endeavors of man?' 
It was then that Alabar battled trained visions focused on the leer in the leaves. At first the leer was all that he could see, but then he caught sight of Shaggy Tail and realized that it was connected to the leer. The tailbone frequently is connected to the leer bone, although today that connection is illegal in 17 states and the District of Columbia. In a moment, the bushes parted, and into the pasture pranced an unbelievable creature, a woolly and goat-like, all woolly and goat-like from its waist down to its hooves, human and masculine above, or to be precise, human above, save for a pair of stubby horns thrusting like bronze-tipped beak daggers in the bright mountain air. You, you are the horned one stammered Alabar. The creature grambled closer, dispelling any doubts about the origin of his stench. In, this, in some places they know me as that. Headabouts, they call me Pan. He, caught, he paused. In some places they call me that. Headabouts, they call me Pan. He paused. Those who still honor me, that is. He paused again. And those who might, who might thou be and what is thy mission? Alabar, once king, once serf, now individual. Have you heard of individuals? Free and hungry, at your service. My mission? Well, frankly, I am running away from death. Pan's hooves, which had been pawing the turf in an almost drunken-like fandango, became gradually immobile, and the leer slowly slid off his face as if someone weak but persistent had had shoved it. His thick lips, dip, lips dipped downward into solemn arc, and in his goatish eyes woe replaced mischief. I, too, he said. What's that, said Alabar? Art thou so famished that thou cannot hear? I said that I, too, am running from death. But that couldn't be. You are a god. You are not the gods immortal. Are not the gods immortal? Not quite true we are. Art immune to the trills and accidents that swallow up humanity. But gods can die. We live only so long as people believe in us. Hmm, I never thought of that, said Alabar. But certainly for the likes of you, there is no shortage of believers. Despite Pan's bed-raggled curls and matted wool, despite the drools in the goatee and the manure on his hooves. He was by far the most impressive being Alabar has ever met. Ha! Where hath thou spent thy life, Alabar, in a pumpkin? Did thou just fall asleep off a turnip cart? I am an eater of beets, proclaimed Alabar proudly. How could such an ignoramus ever hath been a king? Doth thy people reside so far back in the sticks that they never heard the famous voice crying out over the wine-dark sea? Great Pan is dead, Great Pan is dead? Of course, that was nearly a millennia ago, and as even a lout such as thou can see, I am still kicking nevertheless with the birth of Christ. Belief in me dwindled, and I have been scrambling for my life ever since." Yes, now that you mention it, the priest in our church did often refer to you as the one of the false deities. In fact, the way described the devil. In fact, the way he described the devil. The silly man believes there is but one god and one demon. He could be your twin. Thou art Christian? Pan pronounced the word with such a contempt that the flock dancing and glared at Alabar, the bees buzzed angrily at him and passing butterfly that deponed him with remarkable accuracy. Oh wait, <laughs> I misread that. I have to reread that because that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good that's a good line there. Hold on. Thou art Christian? Pan pronounced the word with such contempt that the flock stopped dancing and glared at Alabar. The bees buzzed angrily at him, and the passing Butterfly shat upon him with remarkable accuracy. <laughs> oh, no, no, said Alabar he, hurriedly, wiping the green butterfly poop from the corner of his eye. <laughs> Not really. I merely played along with my neighbors to assuage their suspicion. This fellow Christ is a bit namby-pamby for my taste. And now that I hear what he has done to you, why, I like him less. Even if he did... 
favour individualism. Thou ninny, sir, I will not have you calling me a nanny. Ninny, not nanny. Do thou think I would call thee after one of the things I love best? Pan's heavily lids drooped momentarily at his thoughts strayed to another pasture on other days, days when the petal pink genitals of the she goats drew him down from the crags. Just the same, Alibar, first with the about his knife, fist was about his knife, if thou wouldst out distance death, don't blow thy slender lead by challenging a god, neither Christ, who is not here to defend himself, nor I, who art much closer than I need to be to smite a prideful gnat such as thee. With a dis disagreeable thump, Alibar landed on his chin again. Pan had not moved a muscle. Namby pamby, huh? Christ said that illumination is found only by putting everything one has in jeopardy. Thou, of all humans, should understand the courage that is required to reject the secure blessings of society in order to woo the unpredictable ecstasies of the solitary soul. It is true that Christ has little enthusiasm for dance and copulation, that he took right and wrong too seriously and set himself apart from the natural world. But for all his show shortcomings... He was much superior to thou mortals, who hath embraced him to further thine own ends. Pew. Wow, that was that was good. That was, I should, yeah. Although Alabar was no more fond of criticism than of being flung to the ground like a peach pit, he had learned from the shaman that the path to the marvelous is sometimes cleared by the sharp tongue. And when Pan begins to move away, intimidating that conversation was done. Alabar hastened to draw him back. Tell me, horned one, he called, why do you defend Christ? He is threatening your hide. The god paused, assuming a haunchy staunch, like a woman in high heels. Instead of replying, however, he pronounced reed pipes and blew through them in a manner that caused a sheep to skip again and the little clouds to wiggle in the sky. <laughs> like that. To wiggle in the sky. The music was high-pitched and playful, a frail, tr tremulous, silvery sound that unfurled in lazy spirals without a care in the world. So immense was the contrast between the this light-hearted piping and Pan's demeanor, his crude... Simeon features and great sad eyes that Alibar has moved in spite of himself, and when at last the music ceased, he knocked away a tear with, the, with his knuckle and said, For you, sir, may the jaws of death have cotton teeth. <laughs> For thee as well, answered Pan, but how can we toast without strong wine to lift? And thou did announce my hunger so empathetically that even the deaf roots took note. I'll wager thou beat horny in the bargain. Come with me, Alabar, for while we must go forever in despair, let us also go forever in the enjoyment of the world. In a flash, Pan was across the pasture, Alabar at his heels, scaling the rugged rocks, obviously to the thickets of violet thistles. Alabar was physically fit, hardened by his pleasant labor and recent travels, but he could not, could not keep pace with the god, and soon Pan was out of sight. That was no real problem, however, for Alabar simply following the scent, that elufium of goat's glands that hung in the air like the salty mist and, and drew him over the higher the higher up the crag's vertebrae. The higher Alibar, Alibar climbed, the more piercing his unease. Until he was in a literal state of panic, just when this trilling anxiety was at its zenith, tem tempting him with irrational impulses to throw himself from the cliffs, he heard girlish voices and the sound of splashing water. The panic completely vaporized as the pan odor led him into a grotto, a ferny recess in the middle of which was a pellucid pool. Enjoying the liquid pleasures of the pool were seven or eight unusual human females, short in stature, though full of contour and contour. 
their bones packed into loaves of ivory and petunia, their tangled hair hanging like ropes of seaweed nearly to their heels, their perfect nipples as red as guinea pig eyes, their squeals like the kind teenage frawl had left in Alfric. Sweet genital sparks flew when they looked at Alabar, and he sensed himself in company most benevolent. Directly across the pool, in the mouth of a shallow cave, hunkered Pan, a wine skin in one fist, an erection in the other, and in a roughly day clay bowl at his feet, dangerously close to the sizzling bulb of his member, were olive, olives, figs, and feta cheese. With a jerk of his head, the god beckoned. Alibar was famished, but an orator... To reach the food and drink, he had to wade through the nymph-infested waters. Summoning his nerve, he plunged in. Brunch time in Arcadia. <laughs> it's getting interesting. The remainder of the day was spent in a luxurious pastel stupor against which Alabar's northern temperament rebelled in vain. He had expected the nymphs to be quite wild in their demonstrations, imagined them bitters, scratchers, imagined them biters, scratchers, and screamers, yet neither as king nor serf had he known such delicacy and the softness in which the pleasures of the afternoon were couched made the hero in him a bit embarrassed. When he glanced about him in the pale twilight, however, he saw... Everywhere, evidence of his perception, dried semen frosted the thighs of napping nymphs. Clots of it floated in the shadowy waters like weavering wrenched loose from the looms of the trout. And upon the tips of bracken, their glistened drops too milky to be dew. It couldn't have been Pan's output alone because Alabar's testicles were as flat as juiceless as trampled grapes. Besides, after an hour... Eventful splash in the pool. Pan had crawled into the cave and fallen into a lengthy snooze from which the purring ecstasies of the nymphs were such were much too low to wake him. Pan is not well, the nymphs confided. I watched him scale the rocks. I watched him set four of you to coming in a row, said Alabar. He seemed he seemed fit enough for me. The nymphs released a choir of dreamy sighs. <sighs> You should have seen him when he was in his prime. He's like a sick dove nowadays compared to the goat he used to be. Is it Christ who is making him weak? Not Christ, but Christians. With every advance of Christianity, his powers reside, recede. Said one nymph. It started long before Christ, said a second. Yes, it did, agreed the first. It began with his rise of the, of the cities. There simply was no place in the refined temples of Attica and Sparta for a mountain goat like Pan. A third nymph who with a wad of leaves was scrubbing her clean herself clean of caked secretions joined in. It was a man's jealousy of woman that started it, she said. They wanted to drive the goddess out of the Olympus and replace them with male gods. It's not Pan is not Pan a male god? asked Alabar. True, he is, but he is associated with female values. To diminish the worth of women, men had to diminish the worth of the moon. They had to drive a wedge between human beings and the trees and the beasts and the waters, because trees and beasts and waters are as loyal to the moon as to the sun. They had to drive a wedge between thought and feeling, between the lamplight by which they count and the day's earnings and the dark to which their pan is ever connected. At first they used Apollo at the, as the wedge, and the abstract logic of Apollo made a mighty wedge indeed. <clears throat> but Apollo the artist maintained a love for women, not the op open, unrestrained unre lust that pan has, but a controlled longing that undermined the patriar patriarchal, pa patriarchal ambition. When Christ came along, Christ who slept with no female, neither two-legged nor four, Christ who played no musical instrument, recited no poetry, and never kicked up his heels by moonlight, this Christ was the perfect wedge. Christianity is merely a system for turning priestesses 
into handmaidens, queens into concubines, and goddesses into muses. And who can guess into what it will turn us nymphs? Alibar felt a surge of beet-red temper. Violently, he shook his head. The world is changing, he said, but there will always be a place in it for you and for Pan. Perhaps, certainly, we wish for the moderns no harm, though Pan plays roughly with them at times. And thou, will thou escape the fate thy feareth? No, you misunderstand me. I do not fear death. I resent it. Everything must die, apparently, and I am no exception. But I want to be consulted. You know what I mean? Death is impatient and thoughtless. It barges into your room when you're, you're right in the middle of something, and it doesn't bother to wipe its boots. I have new passion, my darlings, a passion for being myself, and for being more than previously has been manifested for a single lifetime. I am determined to die at my own convenience. Therefore, I journeyed to the East, where I have been told there are men who have taught death some manners. We suspect thou art as foolish as brave, Alibar. In fact, bravery may be the not, to, the not but foolishness. Fear like love is a call into the wild, into the deep, shadowy grotto. Fear is the finer thing than resentment. Resentment, an affliction of the mind, will leave thee complaining in Christ's well-being, well-lighted halls. But fear, a wisdom of the body, will lead thee back to Pan. While Alibar was thinking that over, Pan awoke, stretched, and scampered into the thistles. When, with the sun setting, he did not return, Alibar gave the nymphs a last squeeze and began his long, laborious descent, during with with which he several times heard thunderous laughter ring round about him, and once thought he saw a moonbeam strike high up in the crags, a fleeting horn. Alone with not, with not so much as sperm left to accompany him, Alabar gained and directed his steps towards the east. Alabar again directed his steps towards the east. He was the gate of ex expectation, a pace set more by intuition than by reason, a clip fueled more by vague hints of wonderment than by steady assessments of purpose. He was to continue in that fashion for an appropriately long stretch of liter literary time, passing through more landscapes than there are keys on a typewriter, having more adventures than there are nibs for pens, not once during or following a perilous ex escapade did it occur to him that the unpredictability of this moment of one's death might provide life with its necessary tension. But ever mindful in the kin of Pan, whose memory no encounter had dramatic, could obscure, he allowed himself to resent death less than fear it more. And as he passed through one exotic environment after another, learning languages, wearing out boots, he sang his little song. I love the ground, oh, ground, oh, a ball beneath my feet. The world is round, oh, round, oh, just like a frigging beat. No, he would not be remembered as bard, nor for that matter as a warrior or king. Life is fair, however, and in the fragrant industry, that's right, they said the fragrance industry, his name would one day become an accepted part of the nomen nomenclature, nomenclature, of the nomenclature. According to Priscilla, the genius waitress, an alabar is a unit of measurement that describes the rate in which an old spice aftershave lotion is absorbed by the lace on crotchless underpants. Although at, the n at other times, she has defined it as the time it takes channel number five to evaporate from the wingtips of a wild duck's flying backwards. The wingtips of wild ducks flying backwards. Well, there you go. That's the end of that chapter right there. The next chapter is called Seattle. There it is. Seattle. And that's what we'll read next time. Hopefully sooner than later. 
This has been a wonderful time here. 40 minutes of reading one of my favorite books here, Tom Robbins. Um, if you're tuning in and watching this replay or watching the video somehow, subscribe to my channel. Hang out. I'll be back reading that much more. Look, I got that much more book to go. We've only read that much. So stay tuned. We'll see you soon.